so good to be back again this week. Um, we're a little over halfway. Next Sunday will be our last Sunday, and so it's just been so such a joy and, and uh, a privilege for Iris and I to be back. We love being back in Indonesia. Uh, we've missed it for many years. We've been able to come back and minister a few times, but uh, this time has been kind of an extended time. We'll be spending a few more days after we're finished next Sunday for some ministry and some recording possibly, so uh, this will be the longest we've been able to, to stay, and it's just been a joy. We we love everything. We love the people, and we love the language, and of course, we love the food, and uh, so it's just been awesome to be home again. So uh, next Sunday, um, we'll be finishing, and I, I'll just kind of give a little preview. I'd like to do something a little different next Sunday and do some teaching on an area that maybe uh, many of us have not had teaching, uh, maybe to, to this degree, on on decision-making in the will of God and learning to discern God's voice, learning to discern what, what He wants us to do and what He doesn't want us to do at each stage of our life. So we're going to be talking about legalism and libertinism and, and how we grow in the Lord and, and uh, just divine wisdom from above. So I hope you can be here for that. Hopefully it'll be some teaching that can that can really free you from maybe some wrong ideas that I grew up in the church and, and I used to kind of struggle with understanding how God leads and guides. And so, so that's what we'll be talking about next week. It's training our spiritual senses, learning to develop our spiritual senses. So we'll look forward to that next week. They asked me for these first two Sundays to, to kind of talk about missions. And so today I'd like to talk about it from an angle uh, that maybe you haven't thought of a bit before, but um, just real briefly, I had mentioned that we have two sons, uh, Alec and Andrew. Uh, we also like to call them nitro and glycerin. Uh, they're full of energy. They're now, in a few weeks, they'll be 26 and 23. And of course, they're now stronger than dad. They're faster than dad. They can beat me at any sport, you know, and and so they like, they enjoy that. They feel rather proud about that. And they like to rub it into dad, you know. And so when they're feeling a little proud and cocky, I like to just remind them that, that this right here is their future that they have to look forward to. Because my dad told me the same thing. How many know time is no respecter of persons? Uh, that person you're looking at in the mirror is a, looks a little different than he or she did 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And believe it or not, I used to have jet black hair, a jet black beard. And uh, the only way I'm going to get that now is with all kinds of hair dye and coloring and that kind of thing. So, uh, so anyway, we are all groaning with creation, waiting for the redemption of our bodies, aren't we? But uh, it actually started long before that in 1981. When I graduated from university, and I went to the South Pacific to work with my brother who was a missionary, and before I left, I made a vow to God, because you see, I was still single when I graduated from college. Now, I know over here, that's, that's very, very common, but you have to understand where I grew up, and especially way back then, you know, back in the 1800s, you know, when I graduated from college, um, that, that, you know, usually by then you'd found someone, and my sister was 18 when she got married. My brother was 19 when he got married. And so they're like, why is Jan so slow? What's his problem, you know? And uh, I remember telling the Lord, I knew I was going to the South Pacific to, the, to a little island country, and there's no way I was going to find my wife there. And so I said, God, these next two years, I'm just giving them to you. But after the two years are up, and I, we come back to the States, we're going hunting. We're going hunting for the wife. And so uh, it was July of 1981. I arrived in the islands. I'd never been in the, in the South Pacific before. And of course, beautiful. You know, the sun shines every day. It's very much like here. You know, the sand is as white as sugar. And the palm trees just wave. And the warm breezes that caress your face. And the children always seem happy. And time doesn't matter and, and in Samoa, where, where fat is beautiful in the South Pacific. But I arrived, and I was, that first Sunday, I have to be honest, I wasn't really so focused on the Lord in my worship, because I was kind of looking around at the people to see, 
you know, how they express themselves in this culture and how they worship and that kind of thing. And so I was looking across as they were singing and worshiping, and there she was. And then I said, thank you, Lord, for sending me to this mission field. I just began to worship and praise. She was actually just home for the summer. She was living in Texas in America, going to university. And she was already seriously dating a guy in Texas, in America. But, you know, I, I, I just felt this burden for her, and I began to counsel her and help her see that she needed godly wisdom, that, that you want God's best for you. And, and he clearly is not God's best for you. And, uh, and so it, it took some time and a lot of prayer and I finally, finally won her over, but we, uh, we have been together now for, for over 30 years, and uh, she's just a, a real gift from the Lord to me, and, and uh, I definitely married up, as I mentioned last week. My own family likes her more than they like me, so uh, that tells you something. But, but how many know that when you marry someone, you don't just marry that person? You marry the family. You, you know what I'm talking about? And, and so, especially in Samoa, when you marry, you're marrying quite a family. Because in Samoa, family is everything there. Not just the immediate nuclear family, but the, the extended family. There, it doesn't matter if you're a third cousin, you're family. So we'd walk on the street, and I mean, it seemed like every third person we saw, oh yeah, he's my cousin, oh yeah, she's my cousin, they're my cousin, they're, she's my auntie, she's, he's my uncle, you know, and I'm like, what, <laughs> what in the world? And, uh, but family is so important, and they're fiercely loyal with their family. I mean, it's, it's not just the person you have to worry about, it's, it's the thousand of a thousand standing behind them, the family members that you're going to deal with if, if, if you do something wrong. But uh, her father had a funny experience. When he was about 15, his younger brother, Joe, was 10, and he was having trouble with a bully at school. And so little Joe told this bully, he said, you better stop bothering me or my big brother is going to take care of you. And so this went on for a while, and, and he went home and told his, my father-in-law, my wife's husband, or my wife's father, that, you know, this bully was bothering him. And so he said, you tell him, I want to see him tomorrow after school. I'm going to settle this. I'm taking care of my little brother. So, of course, the news spreads, and everyone's gathered after school waiting for this big fight, this big rumble, you know. And so they're gathering there, and, you know, he's warming up her, her dad. He's 15. He's getting his muscles warmed up. He's ready to take on this bully. And then he starts seeing this guy coming toward them that basically looked like a giant. He was huge. He was massive. And Iris' father knew he was dead. He was going to just get beaten to death. And he's trying to think, how am I going to get out of this? He, you know, it spread all over school. All the kids were gathered. And then he kind of did some quick thinking, and he, and he suddenly turned on his little brother, and he said, why are you bothering this guy? Leave this guy alone. You stop giving him trouble. I'm going to take you home and teach you a lesson, you know. And his little brother's like, you know, where's my big brother? You know, I'm, he's, and so he takes him by the hand and marches him, you know, like he's going to give him a, you know, a sasa is the word for spanking in, in Psalm 1. But, but that's not what you would call being a brother's keeper, family, uh, in that one instance. But I want to read to you something where Jesus talks about family in a very, very important way. And it's in Matthew chapter 12, just, just a few verses. Matthew 12, starting with verse 46, and I believe it's up on the screen. Yeah. Matthew 12, starting with verse 46, it says, as soon as I can find it here, while Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and brother are standing outside. They want to speak to you. He replied to him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister 
and mother. Even at age 12, Jesus understood that his real family were those who had his father's heart, who had his father's will, who understood who they were. And Jesus even here, we're going to see in a moment, he is already starting to see and reach out to his family members who not only were found but were lost. Family members, the Jews, that were far from God. In fact, turn with me to Luke chapter 2 very quickly for just a couple of verses. And I believe that's also on the screen. Luke chapter 2, also verse 46. And it says this. This is after Jesus was in the temple and his family forgets him. And they come back looking for him. And after three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Then Jesus says what? Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house or about my father's business? In fact, another way to render that is, I had to be among my relatives. Jesus already understood that he was here. He had come to reach to the, to the Jews, to the Hebrews, because how many know, those Pharisees and teachers of the law, the vast majority of them, they were far from God. Here was Yahweh standing in front of them, and they didn't even recognize God himself. And Jesus was there to reach the lost of Israel, the leaders of Israel, who were far from their true God. They could memorize the Old Testament, but they didn't know the God of the Old Testament because they had turned his law into a means of justifying themselves. Then I want to read very quickly Romans 8, 28 and 29, a very familiar verse. And we know it. We know in all, in all things God works together those th things for good. I'll just read it to you. Romans 8, 28, but the next verse is the real key. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those whom those God foreknew, he also predestined. In other words, God knows those who are going to choose to come home to him or not. And those that he knows will come home, he has set a destination for us. And what's the destination? To be conformed to the likeness of his son that Jesus might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. You talk about a big family business. That's what we're talking about the world, the human family that he is trying to bring home to his family. The world that is full of all of us. How many know we all have rebelled against God and his heart breaks for us till we come home to him. And he's done everything he can. The creator himself became a creature. He humiliated himself. He hangs on a cross. He, he humiliates himself to the lowest you can, be, you can be in the culture of that day. Because his love. What, what did Misha's chorus say? Only his love, Gassimu, Gassimu, can save us, can give us life. And that's what Jesus came to do, to give life and bring home again his lost children. It's big business. God's, you see, God's business, our Father's business, is his lost children. Our family business is our family. Both our lost brothers and sisters and our found brothers and sisters. We bring them in, and then we bring them up. Speaking of, of, I mentioned it briefly, but big family, big business. We, how many here ever saw the movie My Big Fat Greek Wedding? Anyone here ever see that a few years ago? It's a great movie because it's, it's a true story. I don't know if you know that the lady who wrote it was it about herself. She starred in the movie. She's the one that it actually happened to. She wrote the movie and she starred in it. And at one point, she says to this, you know, her, her new, you know, boule boyfriend, he's an only child, and she says, you know, this isn't going to work. Your family is so different from my family. She said, you're an only child, and, and she said, I have 27 
first cousins alone. I have this huge big family. We're loud. We're this. Your family's so different. Well, on the drive home, my wife Iris was, was riding along, and she said, you know, 27 first cousins, that's not that many. And I'm like, what? She said, I know I have at least 50 first cousins. Now, I'm not talking about second cousins. or I'm saying just first cousins. I said, honey, I, I mean, I know you got a lot, but come on, 50 first cousins? She said, yeah. And she started naming them one by one by one by name. And she got to 99 first cousins. Now, folks, that's a big family. And she said, I know there are a few others that I, that I know are out there somewhere, but I don't know their name. Friends, you think she has a big family. Brothers and sisters, we have, we have brothers and sisters, cousins, if you please, all over this world that belong to us, that we belong to them. And so many of them are just waiting for us to go and show them the way home, to bring them home where we can share eternally. Like Jesus said, those are my real family that will be with me forever. Not just sons or children in the flesh, in the natural, but in the faith. That's the real sonship and daughtership and brotherhood in God's family. But, but God's business is not just big business. It's what? It's eternal business. God's not just about bringing home all of his lost kids and then them staying that way. Okay, now we, we had a beautiful baby dedication this morning. And how many here love babies? I mean, I love babies. We, we had two of our own, you know. Most of the time you love them. Then, then you know, you, you start the sleepless nights and all of that other stuff. And, and uh, the time that you don't love babies the most, for me, is on an airplane. How many know what I'm talking about? I, I, I'm, I'm just confessing here. I'm being honest with you. If you're getting ready to get on a 13-hour flight and in co on comes this young family with one or two babies, little babies, and they got the stroller and the diaper bag and everything, and i got to be honest with you, I usually am praying, and I'm just saying, Lord, please, I just please, this time, don't let them sit next to me. Please, you know. Um, you know I need some rest. I've been preaching hard and working hard, and, and we, the superintendent of the Assemblies of God in America was doing some ministry in Korea, and he flew on a Korean a flight from Korea all the way across the Pacific to America, and he was seated right in the middle of 40 babies, 4-0. They were all Korean babies that were being adopted by families in America, and he was seated right in the middle of 40 babies for like 13 hours. Now, babies are lovely, but folks, not 40 crying babies. Where, I mean, you know, you might as well be in prison. I mean, it was just a torture chamber. You're just like... And, that, and that's kind of that way with God. He doesn't want a family just full of babies. His plan is for what? His babies to grow and mature, and to the point we become like his son Jesus, conformed to his image. That's our destiny. You see, Jesus came as our prototype. How many know what I mean by a prototype? He's the original product that is exactly how it was intended. How many know we were all created in God's image, but what do we do to God's image and likeness? We damaged it. We, we bent it. It's like, how many here like... Uh, you know, some of you would call it jelly. In America, we call it jello. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. And you, you put it in a mold, and then when it's chilled, you take the mold out, and it's shaped exactly like that mold. And that's what Jesus came to do. You see, when we sinned, the mold that originally God made us to be in that image, we dented and damaged and bent that mold. So every human being now is born with the sinful nature, and bent out of shape, not understanding and being who we were created to be. Jesus came as the what? The second Adam. And he came to restore what the first Adam lost, 
And don't look to blame Adam. We would have all done the same thing if we had been in the garden. It, it's, it's a fair representation. But he came to give us the mold again to begin to restore the image of God in us. Amen? He doesn't want us just as, he wants us to become men and women of God with the nature of Jesus, the character of Jesus, the life of Jesus ruling our hearts and in our life. Now, I want to I read a passage to you that's, that's very important. Some of you are familiar with it. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting at verse 10, very quickly. 1 Corinthians 3, chapter, verse, uh, verse 10. Paul is writing, he says, By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the foundation of the temple that God is building. And what's the temple made of? It's made of us. It's made of living stones. Okay? Going on. Um, so then each one should be careful how he builds. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, this is all, of course, symbolic, metaphorical, his work will be shown for what it really is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. You see, God is not just after quantity, how many kids he can get back home. He wants that. But then he's into quality. This is called quality control. How many in business understand quality control? It's maintaining the top quality of your product or service. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it's burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him for God's temple is sacred and you are that temple. He's talking about the living stones have to match the foundation. Okay? If they don't, it won't adhere, it won't bond, it won't stick to that foundation because it's not made of the same stuff. I, th I think the best example I can give is is a heart transplant. And we all know that when someone gets a new heart, first of all, the blood type has to match. But then only time will tell whether it really matches because it can take months before eventually the body will either receive that heart or the tissue won't match and it will reject that heart. And that's kind of what he's saying is when we get God's heart, if we get God's heart, his real heart, then we have his DNA. We have his cells in our, in our life. And if it matches, then it lasts forever. But if we don't, then it will die. It will not become part of the body of Christ. Does that make sense? And he's trying to transplant us into the body of, of Christ. But unless Jesus is in us, unless we're made of Christ, it's not going to last. So it's eternal business that we're trying to do. It's, it's, it's sad to say, but this is what we prayed for this morning. How many know there are many people in the world that because of their culture or tradition, they believe they're a Christian, but how many know they're not a Christian? Why, how do we know they're not? Because they have no life-changing relationship with Jesus. How many know if there's no fruit, there's no root? And it can't, you have to have the root of Jesus ruling your heart before it can produce the fruit of Jesus in your life. It's a living thing. I think one of the scariest verses, if not the scariest in the Bible for me, is when Jesus himself said there are going to be those preachers, evangelists, healing evangelists even, who in the name of Christ did amazing miracles. Because remember, when you preach God's word or the truth of Jesus, he will honor his word. Even if you're not a Christian, he will heal. You understand what I'm saying? 
And he said, there are going to be those who will say, we did all this and we healed people in your name. We preached in your name. And he's going to say what? Depart from me. I never even knew you. Folks, that's scary. When, when preachers of Christ can end up not even being Christians. Not, and that's not me. That's Jesus himself saying that. So he's after eternal quality in our heart that is the life and nature of Jesus ruling our heart. And how many know this is the biggest problem the world has with Christians? If you ask people why they don't become a Christian, what's usually the, the answer? Hypocrites. All the Christians I know, they're hypocrites. They talk and everything, but they're dishonest. You know, they're this, they're that. They don't look anything like Jesus. You know, I've even seen bumper stickers that say, Lord, deliver me from your followers. You know, it's sad, it's terrible, but it's true. And they look at things done in the name of Christ. And, and there's a real simple answer. You want to know what the answer is? Why are those things? How can, how can these people do this in the name of Christ? It's very simple. They're not Christians. I don't care if you grew up in a tradition or a church. You can claim the name of Christ. I mean, you can look at the Crusades and the Inquisition. They are not followers of Jesus. They don't have Jesus living in their heart because they are deceived by their cultural Christianity. You see, Jesus is after the life-changing Christianity. Christianity is what? Christ living in you. Amen? And he wants us. I, I heard the story. In fact, I heard it from Ravi Zacharias, and some of you may have heard it. It's a powerful story from Yugoslavia. This man, his name was Simmerman. And he had grown up in Yugoslavia. And in his area, there were a lot of, quote, Christians who were just Christians by tradition. Christians by just, you know, their culture around them. But these Christians had killed people in the name of Christ. They had done many evil things in the name of Christ. And so he was very bitter toward Christianity. And an evangelist came named Yaakov. Yaakov came and, and Simmerman told him, this is a true story. He said, you know, don't talk to me about your Christ. He said, I see, I see these people who walk around with, your, with the name of Christ talking it all the time and, and this kind of thing. They can wear a cross around their neck. He said, he said, they're some of the most evil people I've ever known. They've killed people in the name of Christ. He said, why would I want to follow someone who does that to people? And so Yaakov very wisely said, well, let me ask you this. He said to Simmerman, he had lived there his whole life in this village. He said, what if a man stole your coat and boots? And this man went into town and he stole something from a store. And as he fled, as he ran away, someone saw around the corner and they saw your coat and boots. They recognized it immediately as your coat and boots. Those are Simmerman. And then they came and they took you to... To, to jail and, and to court and you were convicted and you're saying, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. And they're saying, we saw you. You were wearing your coat and your boots. And then Simon realized what he was saying is a lot of people, they put on the coat and the boots calling themselves Christian. But it's not the real Christ inside. Are you with me? You following me? Year after year, the evangelist Yaakov came. And finally, Simmerman accepted the Lord. And, and he told Yaakov, he said, you know, I remember what you told me about the coat and the boots. And I want you to know, you wear it well. You wear Christ's clothes well. How many want to be able to, to have people say, you know what, you claim the name of Jesus, but I also see Jesus in you. That doesn't mean we're perfect. Of course we're going to fail. But they see enough of Jesus in us that they know it's real. He's alive and, and real in our life. Amen? That's what we want to see for his family. Not just to bring them in, but for us to all grow up and become like Jesus. Well, it's not just eternal business. It's not just big business. But our Father's business is unfinished business. It's unfinished business. I want to read very quickly 2 Peter 3, just two verses. 2 Peter 3, verses 8 and 9. But do not forget this one thing. Dear friends, with the, day, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. 
The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. God does not want one of his lost children to perish. He's waiting for us. You see, we all know that we're supposed to give our burdens to Jesus, to God, right? But there's one burden that God puts on us. And that's the burden to reach our lost brothers and sisters. He trusts us to go out and reach his lost children. God doesn't preach from the sky with a big PA system. No, he does it through his body, through his people. And he has laid that burden that we would reach our lost brothers and sisters. You, you remember the parable of the prodigal. Some people misunderstand the parable of the prodigal son. Because the main point of it they miss I don't know if you remember why Jesus told those stories. He actually told three stories right in a row. The parable of what? The lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. But why did he tell them? He was giving an answer to the Pharisees and teachers of the law who, who condemned him and criticized him for what? Eating and fellowshipping with sinners. And this was Jesus' answer. The parable of the lost ones and then the prodigal son at the very end. You see, the punch and point of the parable is primarily the second son. That's who Jesus is talking to. The Pharisees, who are like the ones who stayed home, they worked for their father, they did what, what was right, but they did not have a love for their father. They did not have a love for their brothers and sisters. They didn't understand what it meant to be a son of their father. And so they didn't really love him, they didn't really, that's why they weren't rejoicing in, in their lost brothers and sisters coming to Jesus. The point and punch is the second son. We can be so religious, and yet the love of God is not in us. The love for our father and the love for our lost ones. That shows whether we have sonship in us or not. Amen? And that's what Jesus was saying with that parable that is so powerful. There was a missionary in Canada and he was reaching an Indian tribe up there. And he ended up leading the chief of the tribe to the Lord. I think it was the Saltu tribe. The missionary's name was Young. And when he, when he brought the chief to the Lord and, and the, the tribe was there, and many of them converted to Jesus as well, the chief was an old man. And he, he then asked the missionary, he said, Now, is God your father? And the missionary said, Well, yes, he's my father. And the chief said, well, then he's my father too. And he said, yes, he's now your father. And, of course, the tribe just clapped, and they were so happy, and the chief, and we're, we're now God's children. He's our father. But the chief wasn't finished yet. He went on to say, I don't mean to be rude or disrespectful, but I have a question to the missionary. He said, then why did it take you? I'm an old man. I'm ready to die now, and I'm just hearing about this good news for the first time in my life. He said, why did it take you so long to tell your brother in the woods, in the forest, about Jesus and the way home to the Father? And the missionary Young said he never forgot it. He never forgot that question. You see, friends, it's not just unfinished, but it's urgent business that we are in. How many are grateful someone found you? You got to hear about Jesus. That's why you're here this morning. Friends, freely we've received. Now we freely give. There, something happened at the Passover feast, the Passover meal. And it was very significant because it's something that if you're a Jew, you wouldn't get what Jesus was doing there. They celebrated, we call it the Last Supper, but what were they celebrating? The Passover meal. And they drank four cups when they celebrated Passover. The first cup is based on Exodus 6. The first cup they drank was the cup of sanctification, being set apart for God. The second cup was the cup of proclamation, to proclaim the name of Yahweh, of God, to the world. The third cup was the cup of redemption. And that was the cup that Jesus took that night, and he said, This is the new covenant in my blood. 
And then they, they worship because he was to be the Passover lamb once and for all, the lamb of God, the sinless lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But then Jesus shocked them. And he said, let's stand and sing and go. So they didn't drink the fourth cup. Now you've got to understand the Jews, these disciples would have been shocked. And so they, they, he leaves, you know, has them leave before the service is finished. What was the fourth cup that Jesus wouldn't drink with his disciples? It was the cup of completion or consummation. He was saying, we can't drink this cup yet because my family is not complete yet. They are still waiting to all be brought home to my father. And only then, only then will we all together stand and raise that cup and celebrate that all my family is home safe and have come home. And then many will come from the east and from the west and take their place at the supper, at the banquet feast. Friends, he's still waiting for us to go and bring them home. Amen? So that we can raise that cup together and celebrate. My brother has a father-in-law that, that's an amazing man. He was a missionary in Brazil for over 50 years. And they just couldn't get him to retire. He just wouldn't come back to the States. He has such a burden for the lost. And finally, they made him retire at age 89. At age 89, he finally came home from the mission field as a missionary. He came back to the States. And he lived in a town called Kenosha, Wisconsin. Now, Kenosha was a town of about 100,000 people. But he had such a burden for the lost. He may have been retired as a missionary. He wasn't retired as, as a witness for Jesus and someone who had a burden for the lost, his lost brothers and sisters. And he went door to door. He always had tracts, gospel tracts and things about Jesus in his pockets that he would share the gospel with people. He walked through that city and went to every single door and put a tract in and covered every house in that city of 100,000 people. Not just once. Not even just twice. But three times, this 89-year-old man went to every home in that city. And my brother, his son-in-law, said, Dad, he said, you know, I get that you're going to, but why do you go three times? He said, well, you know, people move. People move away, you know, and then there's someone else that comes to that. I want to make sure everyone gets covered. But till the day he died, he did not stop reaching his lost... Till the day he died, he was driven by a love for his lost brothers and sisters. I want to finish by telling you about an amazing story from my wife's home country of Samoa. At the center of her town is a monument of the missionary John Williams from Scotland who brought the gospel to Samoa for the first time. And he, there's a monument at the center of the city. He came in 1830. But his burden was not just for Samoa, but for all of the South Pacific. So he began to disciple people and take them on ships to other new converts to other islands. And there was an island that he had a burden for. It was called Eramanga. Eramanga was in the country of Vanuatu today. It used to be called New Hebrides. But in Vanuatu, about a, an island of only 4,000 people. Well, he trained his team of Samoans. They took a ship. They landed on that beach, and the chief there of that island with, with his warriors was there to meet them. And he, he warned John Williams. He said, if you cross this line, he said, today will be your last day. You will not live to see tomorrow. And John Williams answered him through the interpreter. And he said, I must cross that line. My creator, your creator, has sent me to cross that line to tell you he loves you. And he has died for your sins, that you can come home and have peace with your maker, have peace with your creator. And that was the day that John Williams was murdered and martyred on the island of Eramanga. He was 43 years old. It was November 20th, 1839. Over the next 20 to 30 years, six more missionaries from that little Presbyterian church in Scotland came to the island of Eramanga. Every one of them died 
trying to reach those people. Two of them were brothers, George and James Gordon. The first one, George, the older one, he was killed, he died, and then younger James went to reach the people. And then the news came back that he had died too. And it arrived on Sunday at a church, church service, and the mother began to weep and cry uncontrollably. Her second son was dead now, going to that little island. They stopped the service. They tried to pray for her and comfort her. And then she finally said, stop, stop. She said, I'm not crying because my sons are gone. She said, I'm crying because I have no more sons to send to those people. She said, my sons are with Jesus. She said, but those people are lost forever. Those are lost sons and daughters. She said, I don't have any more to send to them to try to reach and save them in time. Friends, how many know that mother was every bit, has every bit the reward that those missionaries that went, she gave her children. Friends, just think of what God wants to do through, with his business through us when we each just give whatever he has for us to give and to change and transform us and the world around us.